Our next speaker, Paul Hawken, many of you know, um, so many of us stand on his shoulders for his years and years of important social change work. He's been um, one of the best writers that we've had who's been able to talk about this and so much more. And just as we were sitting backstage, he, he was reminding me of two important things, which I think really do a good job of spanning the work and a lot of the discussion that we have here. First is he um, is running a business called One Sun, which is able to get solar panels into the hands of people throughout the third world for $29 which is incredible in and of itself. But he also reminded me that he was the press coordinator for the March on Montgomery. Now, if you think about those two giant spans and how important both of those things were, we're really lucky and blessed to have him here today to be able to talk about some of the critical issues. So without further ado, Paul Hawken, thank you very much. Well. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. I just want to acknowledge that we're here at the 25th anniversary of Bioneers, and I want to do a call out to Kenny, who's here somewhere, I'm sure. Nina, are they up there? Hey, there you are. And um, <clears throat> this is uh, where uh, the, the recipients of a gift of visions, visionaries, uh, that when it first started 25 years ago was very marginal as are all things that make change, by the way. Change always comes from the margins. So if you still do or ever feel marginal, it's a good thing <laughs> in this society, and I encourage you to stay there. Um, and I was also want to acknowledge Tom. Um, I was thinking about you know, what makes a good activist, and, and one of the things that makes a good activist is to get older. And, um, but the other thing is, I don't know if there are such things as activists. I think there's just inactivists. And that actually what we're doing is normal. And, and we're living an abnormal time when people don't take those activities to protect just what we saw, which is those beautiful little children that are coming behind us. Or, you know, so I just want to say that Drawdown, which you see here, uh, is, is a project that started in my mind in 2001 after the third assessment report from the IPCC called Climate Change 2001. And right after that, came the carbon mitigation project from Princeton, the famous wedges from Sokolo and Pakala, uh, that, um, and I, at that time, uh, I had learned about climate change in 1976 when I was at SRI with from Peter Schwartz and Jay Ogilvy, and, and so I was very familiar with it. I've been watching it for years and years to see how it diffused, how the knowledge was taken up and how it was received and then, you know, what was happening in society. And I want to say something that people always make fun of me when I say it, but I'm actually really slow. My thinking is slow, and I watch, and I watch, and I watch, and I watch, and I go, what's going on here? What's going on here? And in 2001, I began to think, you know, somebody should do the math on the other side, that is to say, on the solution side. And most of the time when the math is done, it's on the supply side, solar, wind, you know, and a little bit on the, the use side, electric cars, and, and that's understandable to supplant coal. But uh, in when the carbon mitigation project came out with the wedges, it actually made me depressed. And it made me depressed because of nine of the 15 wedges could only be done by huge monolithic utility companies or energy companies, and that depressed me because they weren't going to do it, and they haven't, by the way. And two of them could only be done by big car companies or big utility companies. Two of them could be done by you partly, which is drive less and put solar panels on your roof, which is good. The agricultural soil component was recommendations that the USDA put out during the Dust Bowl. So I figured this is not, this didn't make me optimistic about the future. And it came up again when Bill McKibben did the terrifying global warming's terrifying new math article in July 2012 in Rolling Stone. And once again, we had the math even more eloquently stated by uh, our best statesman and spokesperson in terms of climate change bill. But at the same time, it re-inspired me to say, let's do the math. And Drawdown, Project Drawdown, is about doing the math on what we are doing. And what we are doing in every sector of society that is substantive, that does either one of three things. It reduces the amount of energy we're using, which is critically important. It changes the source of the energy to low carbon sources, renewable. And it biosequesters energy 
in forest lands, farmlands, and grasslands. And that third one is critically important because it's the only way we're going to bring it back out of the up upper atmosphere. And the word drawdown refers to that first time on a year-to-year -year basis that carbon or CO2 goes down in the atmosphere. And what I also took exception to in terms of the Princeton thing because they were talking about stabilization. And stabilization where? There's no such thing as stabilization at 500 ppm or 450 ppm. That's not stabilization, that's chaos. And so to me, let's state the goal that we want. And the goal we want is drawdown. We don't want stabilization. Of course, you go through stabilization to get to drawdown. But drawdown is exactly where we need to go. So let's put the goal out there that we're aiming for as opposed to a goal that will not create what we want and what we desire as citizens. So drawdown is not a plan. It is not a proposal. It is a collection of solutions that are substantive. And what we're trying to do as an organization is reflect back to the world what it knows. And so all of the 80 to 100 solutions are solutions that are in place. We have metrics. We have measurements. We know what they do. We know what they cost. We know the rate of implementation. And what we do is then scale them out 30 years in a just not just a reasonable way, but kind of not pants on fire either, but pants sort of smoldering. You know, it's like hot back there, like as if it really mattered. So the IEA says 20% solar in 2045. We say, no, that's not pants on smoldering. Got to be at least 40%, at least worldwide. Uh, and so we then take those assumptions of scale, and then we do the math. We do the math. And to do the math, we're working with 14 universities. We're working with um, students, with uh, PhDs, with postdocs, with energy analysts, with financial analysts from all over the world, primarily in the Bay Area, to be honest, but because we're here, but all over the country and other countries as well, to do the math. And so it's, I wouldn't say it's crowdsourced, but it's crowd-authored, for sure. And there's several hundred authors of the book and then the website and the database called Project Drawdown. And it's at drawdown.org. You can uh, look at it. And what we're trying to do is do two things. One is uh, here are some of the solutions uh, you can see. And again, you can parse them by you know, what they do, efficiency or source or sequestration. Uh, but what's astonishing is that the table of contents you see here has never been done. Find it. It's never been put together. I, I don't know why. We're not geniuses at Drawdown. We're just making the list. And, uh, and then with that list, we're going to do, like a cash register clerk at a supermarket, we're going to do, <laughs> we're going to add it up and then show it to you and say, this is where we'll be in 2045 if we scale these in a seriously, seriously rigorous way. And of course, solar and wind are going to make substantive uh, uh, contributions. But who knew that LEDs would make such a huge contribution? I mean, 40% of the contribution that solar will make by 2045 will be made by LEDs, since LEDs, the lighting is 19% of all electricity, and they're 10 times more efficient. Uh, and this is like a typical spread in the book. And um, this is, it shows, so we're, we're doing two things with the book. One is the spreads themselves should be interesting, accessible, understandable to a 14-year-old, to a 94-year-old, to a crusty, you know, Iowa farmer who thinks climate in change is a bunch of hooey. And they should be intrigued by it. They can see right away it's 10 times more efficient and incandescent. There is a PPM reduction by 2045. It has net cost and savings, two trillion. Savings is eight or nine trillion over 30 years. Huge return on investment. And then on the bottom, what it has, as you turn the page, the PPM goes down. So the, you know, page by page by page, it's like a little flip book. You go and see <laughs> what it's going to be in 2045. We do not know the answer as yet, by the way. But we have a clue, we have a sense with the pr preliminary calculations that, in fact, uh, we can achieve drawdown by 2045. 
And when we achieve drawdown by 2045, there's a 20 some odd year lag time before you get the first little hint of cooling. Cooling, not warming, cooling. And that's possible. And that's possible with technologies that are in place today. And what my co-author, not co-author, co-editor, co-conspirator, uh, Amanda Ravenhill, who's here, um, have also done is add a, a section called coming attractions. And coming attractions are those, what Wei talked about, those game-changing technologies that are just sprouting up everywhere. We don't put them in the front part of the book because they're not, in, they're not measured, they're not well-established, they're not maybe even commercialized yet, but they're validated scientifically and in and, and, and terms of cost, and they're going to come out this year, next year, and the year after. They include not the Lockheed Fusion announcement that was yesterday, which I think is actually BS, by the way, with all due respect. Uh, you can't contain fusion on a pickup truck. I don't care what you are doing with two or three million degrees. i just like, what are they talking about? I didn't think they smoked at Lockheed, but I guess they do. And <laughs> But there is a company, it, it privately held 14 years. Glenn Seaborg was one of the founders. It's raised over a billion dollars doing boron fusion, and they will have a reactor that does baseload by 2020. There's conductive cooling coming out of Intertech, which eliminates the compressor in cooling cycles. As you know, uh, air conditioning is one of the largest uh, users and draw of electricity in the developing world. Uh, there is autonomous vehicles, which are essentially here, but autonomous vehicles reduce the car fleet by at least 60% in the United States. Uh, and they're coming, you can be sure of it. You're gonna use your smartphone, the car's gonna show up, nobody's gonna be in it, and, and it'll be electric, <laughs> and off you go, and you don't need a car, you just need your smartphone. And it's interesting, the, the companies that make the smartphone, the laptops, so forth, are actually freaking out. And the reason they're freaking out is because we're doing more and more with less and less. And every time we add a camera function or this function to a smartphone, it's something they do no longer make in China and in these factories. So uh, that's one of the dematerialization things that's occurring. So what we want to emphasize is that um, there, there is no one solution. It's systemic. And so what you see in the top there is these colored bars. And so what we say internally is we want to move from, from complacency to agency or urgency to agency. And so often the climate solutions are seen or perceived or put forward as top down or, you know, 30 things you can do to save the earth. And, and somehow the middle is missing. And so we organize it by individuals, what individuals can do, then what communities and neighborhoods can do, buildings and facilities, utilities and businesses, cities and towns, farmlands, grasslands, forest lands, and then provinces and states. We actually haven't found anything, states, uh, uh, countries, and, and the, globe, uh, the, globe, the globe can do, the, the world can do, actually because this is a do book, it's not a policy book. Policy is extraordinarily important to impel and accelerate these technologies and solutions. But we have things in here which are overlooked. And one of the significant contributor to reducing carbon emissions is educating girls in the developing world. When's the last time you heard that in terms of climate change? You know, and the, the math is very simple. We're not talking about what decisions they would make in other areas except for one. And that is when they get past seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, the reproduction rate drops from five to sometimes below replacement rate, but from two to three children per woman. And their daughters and sons also replicate that. And so one of the major contributors to reducing population is actually educating the people who are here. You know, so when you look at the solutions for a drawdown, they're expansive, but they're substantive. And they're not just doodads or technology. Technology, I'm in technology, it's extraordinarily important. I think it's the cat's pajamas. But I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that as that sh shows on the top, these are systemic solutions. And in order to address the system, we need to do the work that Jerry's doing, that Wade spoke about, that 
uh, you know, in terms of the, in terms of policy, in terms of really reversing the perverse incentives that permeate the society in terms of consumption, transportation, energy, and to actually create a path forward that exalts what it is that we know what to do. And what we're saying here is that humanity does know what to do. Our political system, obviously, with few exceptions, does not know what to do. And it follows, unfortunately, the lag time is great, Climate change doesn't, the physics of climate change isn't paying attention to our lag times. And so therefore, what the students are doing, what activists are doing, uh, what Jerry's doing um, is extraordinarily important. What Tom is doing currently, I had the opportunity to work for Governor Brown as well. In the 70s, I was not uh, elected. Nobody would elect me. I had to go through the back door um, privately. But this is a astute Jesuit, Jesuit trained person as governor. He's got a mind that's so sharp, it's ridiculous. And again, about the margins, this is Governor Moonbeam, remember? He was so mocked and so ridiculed and he was dead right on in the 70s. And so I just say that to all of us because we have to do those things that will also Ridic people will ridicule us or mock us or will arrest us or will tell us that you know we're out of step or that this is the momentum, this is where the earth is going and this is where civilization is going, this is where business is going and we know where it needs to, to go. Um, on this project, by the way, we invite you to join with us in any way you want, drawdown.org, you can sign up. Um, partners analysts, researchers, funders, of course. Um, uh, we have a, a key board of advisors that act as peer reviewers. Tom is one of them. Uh, Governor O'Malley from uh, Maryland. Uh, Elizabeth Colbert from New Yorker, extraordinary writer. Terry Taminen, uh, I don't need to tell you who Terry is. Bill McKibben, Tom Steyer, uh, Mike Brune, Janine Benyus, Jane Goodall, uh, Danny Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, we've got two Kennedys. Uh, and we have Dan Kamen at UC Berkeley, we have Michael Mann at Penn State, we have Karen O'Brien, all lead authors, IPCC lead authors. So we're, we're, it's, we're doing this because nothing that will go out will go out without their approval or query or suggestion or editing or saying no, that's incorrect. So that the, we want the numbers to be absolutely impeccable, impeccable. Nobody can challenge us on the numbers and the content is fairly straightforward. And we see it, and as does Tom Steyer, as a, uh, not just a website, as a book, but as a, an instrument to use in policy. Because what we're discovering here is net cost, almost without exception, there is no net cost. It's net savings, 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 savings. A recent report came out from MIT and WRI saying that back, it was a wash, that actually going to a uh, carbon neutral society was actually a wash, it didn't cost anything at all. I think that's totally wrong. I think it's a tsunami. It's not a wash, you know. The, the return is extraordinary. The cost of doing this is nothing when we're trying to save everything in the world. And the mind that says it's a cost is a mind that needs education. Uh, because it does not cost anything to take this world back to a path of giving life, of supporting life, of being life, and, and embodying those qualities in it. And so, but even using uh, modern, or that is to say contemporary economics, the fact is the return is extraordinary, the monetary return, but then the return on health, on well-being, on jobs. Uh, the technology that uh, Dan referred to, one sun, is a printable solar panel, it weighs three pounds. Um, uh, the factory costs two million, it means solar could be made in Botswana, in Haiti, you don't import it from China, it can't be made more cheaply any place else in the world than that place where it is being made. Uh, and the only thing we sell is the ink, that's it, you know. And people then have localized ability to create energy, just like they do with food. And that's what we need in this world. And we need energy for people who aren't gonna be able to afford Chinese-made solar panels, you know, at $300 a pound. 
and that's four or five billion people. And that's the company started by Janine Benyus and myself always was focusing on that market, not the market here in California, not the market in Europe or Germany, but on those people who are so-called localized poor, but are actually locally brilliant. And we need to enfranchise them in this, and they want to be uh, enfranchised. And we need to do it in a way that they can just r roll up a panel like a yoga mat, put it on the back of the bi bike home, and our panel can be nailed to the wall. You just nail it on, that's it. And uh, nobody will steal it, it's too cheap, and it's got nailed on anyway, and so forth. So this is, th the, the, the technological breakthroughs that are coming, and besides us in solar, are astounding astounding what's coming. I know our next speaker will talk about it. I mean, so what we're seeing now, just like somebody mentioned about, it's like a flip phone compared to the smartphone. I mean, what we're seeing coming in solar is just unbelievable here in California, the technological breakthroughs. There's a technology that's gonna take us to 60% efficiency. Morgan's out there with 35% efficiency right now. I mean, the, the, the imagination, the ingenuity, the innovation that's cr that is here now, and this is the coming attractions. And what we're saying is we can do this. We can do this. There's no reason we can't do it, and we do it together. And to paraphrase uh, a sentence I, I wrote about carbon, carbon is the element that holds hands and collaborates, right? That's what it does. All you have to do is be like carbon. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>